I'm Krista Boucher from Orcas Power and Light in East Sound, Washington. Welcome to Along Those Lines. Support for this podcast comes from Meridian Cooperative. Recognizing that member relationships are always evolving, Meridian delivers solutions that enable co-ops to fully participate in their communities. Hi, everyone. This is a podcast about electric cooperatives, the work they do, and the challenges they face. I'm your host, Scott Hoffman. Locally owned electric cooperatives have always worked to improve the quality of life of their members. These efforts run the gamut from permanent charitable funds to youth tour sponsorships to things like broadband and on-bill financing for home efficiency upgrades. But over recent decades, as many rural areas have suffered population declines, loss of businesses and key services, and stagnating economic growth, it's been electric cooperatives that have stepped up to try to reverse this worrisome trend, embracing broad community development efforts and helping marshal the passions and creativity of their community's leaders. Here to talk about how co-ops are leading the effort to revitalize America's rural areas is Jana Adams. She's the executive director of Touchstone Energy Cooperative, which focuses much of its efforts on helping its cooperatives improve quality of life for their members. Later, we'll hear from two cooperative leaders who are spearheading ambitious efforts to bring vitality and growth back to the regions they serve. Jana, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for being here. Well, thanks for having me, Scott. Okay, so today we are talking about community development, placemaking, concepts like that. I wonder if you could just sort of give us a sense of what we mean when we say those things. Sure. So community development is, you know, exactly what it says it is. It is making sure that you have the right things in place to serve your community. And I would say placemaking is is an example of community development. It is specifically taking those public places and making them uniquely attractive to your specific audience. So you're using everything to the best of its potential, whether it's taking a, a public place and greening it up and making it more renewable because that's of interest to your community or in general, just making things pretty and a nice place to live. Awesome. And as another sort of level set, why is this something that electric co-ops would want to do? What's driving the impulse to do this for their communities? Electric co-ops uniquely serve their community. They're owned by their community. And so there's a natural connection between serving your community with electricity and in general, making it a good place to live. That electrical service is is one component of what co-ops do. And they have a broad array of services they offer to their community. And this is certainly one of them. You know, there is a a self-interest as well for the cooperative because if the community is more successful, It helps their load profile. They have more businesses. Their community is more prosperous. And certainly that is good for the electric cooperative. And Touchstone Energy has sort of been in this community development since the beginning, since the beginning of Touchstone. But it's fairly recent that you've gotten into the placemaking thing, probably four or five years ago. I wanted to get a sense of what are some of the projects that you're helping co-ops do with these efforts and some of the specific things that you as a national association have offered them to help them do these things. Sure. I'd say we got really focused on the placemaking piece during the pandemic, just pre-pandemic and during the pandemic, as it became clear that we needed to revitalize Main Street. Small businesses were so hit during um, certainly the economic downturn in the you know late single digits, well into the into the twenties of the the pandemic, and they needed help. We have a national discount program called Co-op Connections. It's great; you can get discounts on a lot of things, but it's not its real advantage. Those things are a dime a dozen. Everybody has a loyalty program. What you can now do, and what our members do with Co-op Connections, is they spotlight their local businesses. So rather than saying, "Hey, you can go to you know the big box store and get a discount," you can go to the corner store that serves specifically your community, and they're able to use the platform to spotlight those small businesses. And so from where you're sitting, you're at the national level, you're in contact with co-ops all the time that are utilizing these programs. And I know we've seen some successes. Are you seeing this as sort of a groundswell? Because I get the sense that rural is sort of coming back. It is. I mean, one of the things that is a little bit of an aside, but I think is super cool, is we do have a partnership with the folks in Laurel, Mississippi. And um, the hosts of the hometown show on HGTV now basically do placemaking across the country. They've got a series where they go into small towns, and they're not uniquely co-op, but I'm sure a lot of them are, where they're doing exactly what we're talking about, is taking those public spaces, making them attractive, 
breathing fresh air into those small towns. And I think that's exactly what our co-ops need to be doing is everybody has natural advantages and resources, loosely speaking, in their local community. Take advantage of them make them beautiful. It's not hard. I use the example that if you're working on something and you sit down to a lovely desk that's clean and organized and you have the tools you need, you're going to be more successful. And that's really what placemaking is about, is taking and having that clean slate and that beautiful place to be productive and to be good citizens within your community. And I think we're seeing people across the country doing that. One area that I think Touchstone Energy is getting more and more involved in is specifically support supporting, very loosely speaking, economic development. There are still many rural communities that are underserved with jobs, that they need investment in their communities. And so we have been working very closely with the folks in Kentucky. They use the Touchstone Energy name. That's what they lead with when they're promoting their service territory, the entire state. And they have a lot of successes with that. And so we're helping support that awareness uh, within international site selectors and other areas to make sure that they know that when you're investing in Touchstone Energy Service Territory, you're not getting that one small co-op. You're getting a wide network with available resources across the country. And, uh, and the message is really resonating with a lot of international businesses. That's such a great point. And I love what you guys are doing. I love how you guys are owning this issue. And I want to thank you for coming on and give us sort of that national perspective. So thanks so much, Jana. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Next up, we have Erica Sheehan. She's the Community Relations Liaison at Lynch's River Electric Cooperative in Pageland in Northern South Carolina. She helps implement the co-op's extensive community development and placemaking efforts. Erica, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Can you start off by telling us a little bit about Lynch's River EC and the region you serve? Sure. So Lynch's River Electric Co-op was founded in 1939 for the sole purpose of providing electricity to the surrounding communities, more specifically the rural communities. Today we serve roughly 21,000 members across three counties. Those are Chesterfield, Kershaw, and Lancaster. Our offices are in Pageland, South Carolina, which is located in Chesterfield County. In addition to providing power to the rural communities, our CEO, Brian Broughton, as well as Lynch's River employees, created our fiber subsidiary, RiverNet Connect. So our board of trustees voted and the process began technically in 2019, but by 2020, we had our first zone that was open and available to members to apply for internet service. So we just saw that there was a real need for access to high-speed internet for our members, especially in today's time. And I'm happy to say that just last week, we reached a huge milestone of 4,000 members connected. That's great. And honestly, that sort of fits in with what we're talking about today, the idea of community development of improving the lives of your members. Now, Lynch's River won what's called a co-op community contest, which is sponsored by Touchstone Energy back, I think it was in 2019. Tell us a little bit about that competition and what it was that LREC won. Okay. So the contest invited co-ops from across the country to submit proposals for planning and implementation guidance to help with economic development in their communities. David Sides, Timothy Griffin, who works with the town of Pageland, and myself decided to nominate Pageland because we thought it just had the most potential for growth and was a great fit for this particular contest. As far as the prizes go, there were three prize packages to be awarded in the form of economic development consulting services and growth plans. So I believe they were estimated to be about a $20,000 value the knowledge that we would be gaining from these professionals. And we chose the Proud Passion Project Package. (laughs) That's a mouthful. This plan included on-site consultation meetings and conference calls, which were led by the hometown team, Jim and Mallory Raspberry, who were husband and wife, and Josh Noel of Laurel, Mississippi. So basically, we were tasked with creating a project in our community that we felt would really spur economic growth as well as increase morale. And Lynch's River was one of three nationwide winners. That's great. So your actual winnings were being able to work with this celebrity team of developers. Yes, their specialty is creative placemaking. They did kind of the same downtown revitalization in their town, Laurel, Mississippi. So they had been there, done that. So we were very, very happy to have won a chance to work with them. And in your work with this team, what exactly did you come up with in terms of placemaking and community development for your communities? So our main project and what I can say we 100% completed at the end was a mural. We had other ideas, but that was the main thing. 
And one of the reasons we felt a mural would be a great way to kind of get the ball rolling on revamping our small town was the location of Pageland. It's located roughly 20 miles south of the Charlotte, North Carolina metro area, and also along the beach highway, as most call it, which runs straight through town. So this gave us the access we needed to draw people in, but we needed to give them a reason to stop instead of just driving through on the way to vacation. You know, you've seen murals and they're one thing, but a greetings to Pageland mural is another. It's literally a giant welcome sign that invites people to see what Pageland has to offer. So the town of Pageland, along with the hometown team, worked together to create the 1950s postcard theme uh, with designer Eli Morgan, who is also from Mississippi. And it features our famous water tower, watermelons, we're known as the watermelon capital of the world, and also showcases in each letter of the word Pageland, an image that symbolizes an important aspect of the community. So we have a local airport, the LREC headquarters are here in Pageland, and it also highlights resources like cotton and timber. It's beautiful. I've seen it online, and I honestly, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, I I think people think of murals as a painting on a building, cool, but not something that can really like anchor a town. But I think in your circumstance in a lot of these rural towns, it really does bring a sense of vibrancy and energy to a downtown area. Can you talk a little bit about why you settled on a, on a mural? Sure. To start with, we kind of had a theme downtown and it was gray and brown and, you know, classic downtown vibes. And we wanted something that was just totally different. So it is the brightest shade of green I think I've ever seen. It's along the side of a building going straight through downtown. Again, the theme is the 1950s postcard. So that just ties in with that nostalgia that people really love when visiting small towns and thinking back on memories with their families. And every part of the mural highlights what's important in Pageland. And so what are some of the other things that you were planning? I know you had mentioned that the pandemic sort of deferred some of the plans you were planning to, to implement as part of this process. Talk a little bit about some of the other things that you either have in train or are hoping to do soon. Sure. So we had in our plans four different projects. One was kind of tacked on at the end, which was an, the ultimate goal, an open air farmer's market. So where people could come and sell their produce and get handmade goods from the locals that we realized is Something we still want to do, but that's going to take some time. That's a future plan. We had the mural project, which is actually comprised of three separate murals we wanted to do, starting with the Greetings to Pageland mural. We also wanted to do an art alley featuring local artists, a place to connect our park to the main street where you could go shopping because the parking was in the back. So there was no access, safe access to get around to where the shopping was from the park. But like you said, uh, COVID kind of stopped us and said, wait a minute, let's be realistic and see what you can accomplish in this time frame. Yeah. So when you decided to apply for this grant. Had you already been doing a lot of these things or thinking about them? Was there something going on in your region that made it important to do this, losing residents, suffering economically, things like that? So we, we've we always been involved with the community. That's just a part of the co-op world and small towns. But I would say in the past, Pageland was suffering a little bit. We, we saw a decrease in residents. You know, you had stores closing children moving away to bigger and better things. And again, like I said, COVID, I feel like had a huge impact on this as well. And people are now, they seem to be more concerned with their quality of life and spending time with their loved ones. And so now we're seeing an increase in population. We're having ribbon cuttings for new businesses. It seems like every other week and houses are going up everywhere. I mean, on every corner. So this new interest in small town living and You know, the good life is just awesome. And I believe that our mural is a perfect representation of what small towns like Pageland have to offer. So I wonder if you could give sort of our listeners who are are hearing what you say and and all of the great things you're doing a little bit of advice on how to get started. I I know a lot of co-ops as sort of their DNA do these community development just by nature of who they are. But in order to sort of get to that next level the way you guys are doing, is there anything that you could kind of give them uh, some quick advice on, on how to start there? Sure. So my biggest suggestion is going to be 
just take the time to find out what needs are in your communities that you serve that are specific to the members in your communities. You may not be able to help them with every issue, but the best way to start is just to simply ask, what do you need? You know, what are you struggling with? And then commit to a plan. And remember, it doesn't have to be a huge grand gesture or anything super complicated. Small wins, step by step, mural by mural, you can make a difference. That's great. I love the work you guys are doing and I would love to come down and see that mural and congratulations on the growth that you're going through right now and keep up the good work, Erica. Thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thank you. Next, we're going to hear about a few big community development efforts at a co-op in Ohio. But first, let's pause for a word from our sponsor. Support for Along Those Lines comes from Meridian Cooperative, an IT company that's a lot like you, focusing on people and partnerships as much as on technology. Meridian believes in delivering software solutions to help you build and nourish relationships with your members and your communities. And their cutting-edge technologies empower your people to power your hometown. Find them online at meridian.coop. Hi, I'm Lori Freeman with Singing River Electric in Loosedale, Mississippi. You're listening to Along Those Lines. Welcome back. Next up, we'll talk to Dan Boisel. He's the Economic Development Manager at Consolidated Cooperative in Mount Gilead, Ohio, near Columbus. Consolidated has multiple successful development efforts in their territory, and Dan has been involved with most of them. Dan, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Look forward to it. Let's go ahead and start. Just give us a sense of Consolidated, your territory. Tell us a little bit about your co-op size and, and things like that. Great. We're a merged co-op. So 20 some odd years ago, merged two smaller co-ops, actually consolidated two co-ops together, hence the great marketing term and uh, new name. But we're about 18,000 members now, and we sit in central Ohio, just north of Columbus, Ohio. So uh, consisting mainly of two counties and then some small surrounding parts. But Delaware County is the fastest growing county in the state and probably one of the top 10 in the nation. And then Morrow County is a more rural agricultural county. Still growing, but uh, growing at a much, much slower rate. So that's kind of where we're at. And we provide electricity first. That's the mother ship, if you will. And then uh, we've been in the internet broadband area since 1986 with C-band satellite dishes and then propane, natural gas, and then now we're in fiber to the home. So we've done kind of all that stuff. And, and you're also into community development. You're also into sort of the placemaking idea. I know the way you approach community development has been fairly robust over the last years. Can you talk about the top level projects and initiatives that you've been working on and that you're working on now? Sure. I think to uh, say that we have these huge initiatives may not be the correct quote as much as we've been involved with communities. It's in our blood. It's in our mission statement. Our board has directed us to be part of that mission statement and vision statement is to help direct our community. So we've had somebody involved I'll go back almost 30 years in the uh, initial development of a water system in Morrow County, one of the original board members there. And from that position on, I think we've been involved either financially in helping schools, helping communities thrive and grow. I said a little bit ago, we were in broadband and uh, we've been in uh, fiber to the home broadband for Oh, four or five years. And right as we were going into the pandemic, we have several schools that's on our lines. And so to provide free Wi-Fi in their parking lots during the pandemic was just natural. And so those kind of things, I think, are the projects that we see us being involved with whenever we have an opportunity. A small one most recently is to help fund a water park, splash park, in one of our smaller communities around. So one of the things we, we've been talking about in this podcast is the idea that rural areas have gone through this sort of a malaise of, of sorts over the over the last 20, 30 years. Have you seen that in your territory? And, and was it consolidated sort of push to try and turn that tide with Delaware and the other county you mentioned? Uh, yeah, Morrow County is the other county. And uh Sure, you, you see that, so that's why you get involved in, uh, again, uh, the most recent is a revolving loan fund that we have. We've used a revolving loan fund for a uh, a brewery. It's called Henmick Brewing, and uh, 
10 years ago, we thought about doing this and then thought it was a bad idea. You know, this craft brewing thing was a phase. Well, it's a big phase now. We were a part of doing a placemaking opportunity. It is now a place that has, oh, I don't know, last weekend there were 1,200 people there on a Saturday night. So, you know, it brings all these people into this small community of 50 or 75 called Kilburn, but it helps bring people into a community, helps provide a place for community, and they also spend their money there. And that's great. We want people to come. Yeah, and we're focusing a lot on placemaking in this. Can you talk about some of the things that you identified early on for this town and, and you know, for the, the needs of this particular brewery that sort of spearheaded that and led out this effort? Oh, it was a, a great opportunity. So it was a local family who has been on the farm for, I think he's the third generation or fourth, and didn't want to farm, but wanted to keep the farm in the name. And so thought he could make it a go of it with a brewery. And so it's been three years, I suppose. And we've just had that opportunity to provide some revolving loan fund and some, some money to help him bridge that gap to get it started. I love this part of this trend for rural America. It seems to focus on breweries quite a bit. That seems to be an anchor business that fits for these communities. Well, I, I think it's easier to get into than a distillery, I think. And I'm a gray hair now when it comes to uh, the demographics. And uh, the craft beer thing is a 40-year-old a man's game. And we see a lot of them, a lot of kids now. When we were first married, my wife and I, we lived in a small town that was very much of German heritage. And to see kids in a bar was nothing. And it's, it's back to that here. You see kids running around and uh, it's okay. And it works out really well. And for the community, again, as we look at community and placemaking, it puts this little town on a map. And again, Kilburn is a town that was, uh, uh, we, we can't take credit for it all. There's several people who are investing money and time into building this small community, but uh, it puts it on the map where people from, gosh, three or four counties want to come over and, hey, let's see what it's like to be here for the evening. Consequently, that brings more housing and housing is where electric cops especially make their money. So I want to talk about your sort of side job that you have. <laughs> you are currently president of NREDA, and that's a group that electric co-ops helped create back about 30 years ago. Can you talk a little bit about what they do, how you fit in, how long you've been with them, uh, and how rural areas benefit from the role that they play? I would love to. NREDA is National Rural Economic Developers Association. And so as a group, again, put together 25 years ago by electric co-ops and telephone co-ops. And so we can't forget them. And even though their membership may have waned at the moment, they're still a vital part of more rural areas than, than what you might imagine. If you go to many meetings about key accounts or let's say member services or even economic development, they want to talk about everything that happens in the metros and nothing that happens in rural America and rural Ohio. So this filled that spot. And so it's made up of people who have a passion for rural, a passion for economic development, and it provides expertise for people to ask questions and to feel comfortable asking questions and networking with people who have a similar passion uh, across the nation. It is. It's amazing how many electric cooperatives are involved in that group. It's a great project. Well, they need to be. I'll just holler a little bit. They need to be. They need to be passionate about uh, what goes on in their community because uh, nobody else does. In many communities, and I'm going to highlight Morrow County for a moment, the funds aren't there and the personnel aren't there to really help push economic development because there's many other things going on that they uh, have to worry about that's more urgent. We are one of the uh, promoters of uh, economic development study to look at again, where that county sits and what their strengths are, and then how to put together an economic development program, which fits them best. And so we can move forward in their growth with manufacturing or warehousing or whatever might fit best. Yeah. That's a very great segue into my last question, which is sure there will be co-op folks who are listening to this podcast who think, well, that's good for them. They got what they need to do these things. What can you tell co-ops on how to get started? Co-ops across the board do community development stuff just as part of their DNA. But how do they get their game to the next level? How do they step up? It's a long game. So don't expect what you're doing today matters this afternoon. We're doing things, and just like my predecessor who helped start the water company 30 years ago, we landed three or four years ago the largest warehouse that they've ever had in the community. And it never would have taken place if we didn't have water. It's a long game, and it takes more than one or two people to do it. It has to be a commitment from the sea level on down to be a part of that. And I guess the biggest thing is start. 
take that first step. If you have questions on how to do things, I would advise to you know, join NREDA. Well, Dan, I love the work you're doing. Thanks so much for being on the podcast. Scott, it was my pleasure. Thanks so much. And thanks to you, our listeners, and to our sponsor, Meridian Cooperative. For more on this and other podcasts, visit electric.coop. Until next time, for Along Those Lines, I'm Scott Hoffman. I'm Chris Todd from Northeastern REMC in Columbia City, Indiana. Thanks for listening to Along Those Lines. Subscribe and rate us on your favorite podcast app.